Welcome to the UOUC talk show. Our goal with this show is to introduce you to the most interesting people with the most interesting ideas. Today, we have a very special guest, Dr. Gene Robinson. Welcome. Well, thank you. Pleasure to be here. So I want to start the, this conversation uh, with something we've been thinking a lot about um, in the past, which is this idea that you can really do anything if you're able to align the incentives of, of people, of organizations, and, and so on. And in a way, you know, the, 20th, the 20th century was about you know, everything that people kind of did was related to solving all diseases, in a way. And the 21st century seems to be a century that will be remembered as a century of coordinations. So given that context, given what you've learned in your research, do you have any thoughts on how we can best align the incentives to either create projects that you wouldn't normally have been able to, or, or really think deeply about this question? Mm -hmm. Well, um, I can answer that question by drawing on our research on honeybees, and um, that in that context, it's very instructive to look at uh, incentives in a honeybee colony and compare and contrast them to what goes on in human society. So in a honeybee society, um, there is a very strong alignment of interests. In the case of honeybees, the alignment of interests is genetic or familial. Um, the individuals are closely related to each other and it's really wired into their DNA that their fate depends on cooperating, on working together. And if they work together and support the queen who is related to them, then the queen can have lots of babies and there can be lots of other bees and then the society can prosper. So in that case, in the case of honeybees, the alignment and the incentive structure is uh, simple in the sense that it's based on uh, working together, helping your relatives. In the human society, uh, things get more complex and, um, and therefore more interesting in some ways because whereas in human evolution we do strongly suspect that there was a time when that was the primary form of social organization, that meaning kinship, familial groups, we also know that humans have gone way beyond that and we have social structures, organizations, academic, private, corporate, that go beyond relatedness, that, that rely upon bonds that are created among individuals um, based on other kinds of shared interests. And so how does one uh, create a situation and how do people in, in, in groups create situations where interests are aligned so that cooperation um, can be facilitated? And how, how is it possible to get people to see to see that. And basically the lesson is that the bigger the group, um, the more difficult uh, that is, that it's harder to find those commonalities. That doesn't mean we shouldn't be trying and working hard to do so because while it might be um, easier to see that the fate of an individual bee in a colony depends on the success of its colony, that's certainly the case for humans, um, that, the, that the success of an individual and the fate of each individual on this planet really depends on some levels of cooperation. But it's much harder to, um, to see that in practice. Is this genetic factor more conscious in bees or is it just, it's like natural, like blinking your eye or something? Is it hardwired like that or is it something that they think of consciously when doing these actions? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. And that's always the sort of $50 million question in animal behavior. Um, and so um, I can give a couple answers. The 
first and simple answer is that we don't know. But um, the more elaborate answer is that what the approach one generally takes is to be uh, mindful of the idea that in science you try to explain something as simply as possible. And if that works, then you say, okay, I think we've got some explanation. And if it doesn't, then you try something more complicated. So it is possible to um, model a scenario along the lines of what you're describing where it is more or less hardwired, where individuals can recognize each other um, and can recognize uh, levels of relatedness not by a light bulb going off and saying, oh, you know, I'm related, so therefore I will, you know, um, cooperate more, but it being uh, sort of baked into their behavioral programs in a kind of computer program like if-then sort of thing. Now, what makes it interesting is uh, we can model that more simply without invoking consciousness, but we don't know. Uh, really, um, that, that's the scientific answer. Um, we have no evidence um, to know whether there isn't something um, more elaborate going on. Uh, the history of animal behavior is basically one of consistently underestimating animals and their abilities. Having said that, it is a very reasonable explanation to say in the case of honeybees that you do not need to invoke um, any higher level of cognition other than they can distinguish individuals based on how similar they are to each other in, um, in the case of honeybees, in their smells. And the more similar they are, the more cooperative behavior is elicited. Yeah, it, it, that's something that you said that uh, over, you know, throughout the times, we always underestimate the nature of animals. And just, I remember last year reading an article how birds, they basically has this sort of quantum GPS uh, way to, to do that. And perhaps there's something deeper about bees and how they interact that, uh, that is interesting. But you, you, mentioned, uh, you mentioned consciousness. And there's, there's this idea that um, there's some sort of a collective consciousness in, in the world, perhaps. Um, how much do you think that's... Like, do you see anything like that in, in your research with bees? Do you think there's some truth to that in our human civilization? This idea of having a human consciousness that are, you know, like everything, it's kind of, um, it's kind of hard to explain, but this idea of a collective consciousness that, like, if you learn how to do X, Y, and C, therefore, it's easier for people in the future to do that mm -hmm. kind of a hard idea to explain, but do you think that's sort of true in our human civilization? Well, there's no evidence for that. Right, right. Um, and you are talking to a card-carrying, empirical, skeptical scientist, <laughs> and so uh, I would say that it, uh, it's it's um, not something that uh, is clear at all. Um, is is a necessary explanation for the phenomena that we see? So I'd be very skeptical um, about that. Yeah. And, yeah, another thing that I found interesting was about this idea of the division, the division of labor. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the history of, of civilization, you know, like you can see like people specializing in something. Uh, it's you can that helps explain the idea of progress in a way. But we were talking to in the past. We talked to this business professor, Dr. Torelli, and he was he has he has he's written many articles and books on the idea that you know specialization is not enough because we've made so much progress in different fields that it's really hard, even if you have a PhD, it's really hard to make progress in it's such a field. So how do you, so going back to the idea of coordination, how can we, like this idea of like, how can we, I guess in, in a sense is a, I guess what, like, what, like what I wanted to ask is that, Given what you learned from instincts when you were learning about, like the idea that learning comes from instincts, mm -hmm. like how can we, like, like given what you learn, how can we learn more about uh, this idea of like specialization and, and, and finding out what we truly instinctively 
are good at? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's a fascinating question, and honeybees are a, a great model to be looking at to uh, to illuminate that question because honeybees uh, have a great balance of uh, specialization, division of labor, and flexibility. So uh, let me explain a little bit about the division of labor in in honeybees. So. Um, Adult worker honeybees live about uh, six weeks. They spend the first two and a half to three weeks working inside the beehive, and then they graduate um, and become foragers and they work outside the beehive. So um, when they're inside, um, the first two and a half to three weeks, they progress through a series of different jobs, and they specialize on those jobs for a few days uh, for, for each one. Then they make that, so those are a series of transitions. Then they make the biggest transition from working in the hive to foraging. So foragers, what they do is when it's nice weather and they're flowers, they go out and make trips back and forth to look for flowers, to find them, uh, and then collect nectar and pollen, bring it back to the hive. That transition usually takes place, as I said, between two and a half to three weeks of age. Now, if something happens to the colony, for example, if they lose many or most or all of the foragers in the colony, um, predation, some kind of accident, pesticide poisoning, so forth, the colony is now in a situation where it's sort of like you cut off its head. So what happens? Does the colony just sit there and die? No, there's plasticity. Some of the young bees that would otherwise be working in the hive doing jobs in the hive, they accelerate their maturation and they become precocious foragers. They start to forage at an age younger than what they would normally. Um, likewise, you can have a situation where, again, you have a division of labor, you've got young bees working in the hive, old bees foraging, and something happens to the young bees in the colony. So some of them succumb to a disease of some kind or another, leaving very few then you can have two things happen. One, some of the remaining young bees can delay their maturation. They can slow it down so they become over age at what they're doing, nursing, taking care of the baby bees. Rather than grow up, graduate, become a forager, they slow their maturation down. And then the most extreme version is you can have foragers that have already bees that have already graduated, have already become foragers, they can actually revert, become young again, and take over the jobs that um, yeah, young bees do. So they have their roles, but yet there's plasticity in their roles. And then the question arises, and that is, well, how do they know what, what to do? So um, as in labor markets, as in the economy, as in the stock market, as in grains of sand in an avalanche, there's no centralized control. There's no direction, central direction. The queen doesn't tell the bees what to do, uh, but instead individuals pick up local signals and then those local signals have evolved to convey global information again, in a kind of automatic way. So we studied this process uh, extensively a um, number of years ago and found that the way it works is older bees, foragers, produce a chemical, and those chemicals are called pheromones, that affects the behavior of other bees in the colony in a very particular way. It delays the maturation of the young bees. So when you think about it, the more foragers that are there, the more of this inhibitory chemical is produced and circulating among the bees. So the young bees are inhibited from growing up, and so you have a nice division of labor. You remove the foragers, you're removing this inhibition, some of the bees will mature rapidly because they don't have this inhibition, and so on and so forth. So this pheromone can expand the circulation uh, and the distribution of the pheromone can explain how you see plasticity as well as then specialization. And then now what we know is that this pheromone affects the activity or the expression of genes in the brain to orchestrate the right behavioral state. 
Have you found some similar patterns or anything related to, because I know humans also have their own like chemicals and is there any pattern that you have found like a parallel between the two at all? Like that could, that some similarities of how these bee, bees colony, bee colonies function and how like human societies and they tend to work? Well, uh, I'll answer that in a couple of ways. Um, trying to achieve a balance of plasticity and division of labor, um, which involves, which implies specialization, is what many organizations strive for to try to find that balance. And so it is something that's definitely of interest in the business world and in the academic world, any world where you're looking at organizations of people. How do you allow for flexibility to respond to changing conditions um, while at the same time having some sort of defined roles? Because specialization allows individuals to get better at particular jobs, and that happens for honeybees um, uh, as well. So there are those parallels. Um, the particular mechanisms by which they are achieved obviously are, are different. Um, the whole question of pheromones um, that, that they're very well developed and very, there are many um, pheromones in animals. The whole question of whether there are pheromones in humans is uh, controversial. So the evidence hasn't been super strong. On the other hand, we have a billion dollar perfume industry. So um, that's Artificial high, <laughs> highly suggestive of the fact that we understand that chemicals influence the behavior of, of humans. That is very fascinating because I think this raises very important questions about evolution as a whole because I'm pretty sure like the bees when they like when they were like the origins of bees I'm sure they didn't start off as this but as the centuries progressed they de developed these traits and these genes which made these colonies function better and like you can talk about the um, survival of the fittest or all these theories where what worked st stuck around. Mm -hmm. um, what, what do you think, like, do you think there is more that, that can change or like more of these colonies can be improved or do you think they have reached like a steady state in their evolution? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's a fascinating question. Um, evolution is not static um, and there always can be uh, changes um, to any particular trait if the uh, pressure to change is strong enough. So I'll give you an example. Um, there, uh, for honeybees, there is a great deal of variation in how aggressive colonies are in defending their beehive. So um, there's a great deal of variation across the world. Um, I think probably you've heard of the so-called killer bees, um, a particular uh, subspecies of honeybee that has evolved under very harsh conditions um, and has a higher level of aggression. Other subspecies have evolved in areas where uh, there are less threats and so they have lower levels of aggression in defending uh, their hive. So um, what happened on the island of Puerto Rico about 20 years ago is very interesting. So the so-called killer bees, um, the particular subspecies that um, known for their higher levels of aggression, they have spread throughout the, uh, the Western Hemisphere, and they reached Puerto Rico, an island, and um, within 10 years of reaching Puerto Rico, a discovery made by a former student of mine who's now on the faculty at the University of Puerto Rico, was, hey, these bees came and they were really aggressive, and now they're much less aggressive. What's going on? So the evolution happened over a shorter period of time. Uh, we here, in collaboration with, uh, with his lab, his name is Turu Garai, with Professor Garai's lab, uh, studied the genomics, and we saw there were changes in the genome um, associated with those changes in behavior. So this happened in real time, you know, just over the past 20 years. So evolution can happen. Sometimes it can happen fast. Depends on the strength of the change that um, is uh, suggested by the environmental pressures and how much competition there is and how much survival of the fittest uh, there is um, under these environmental conditions. You think there's such a thing, um, from what you've seen, 
such as the uh, the numbers number, which is the idea that you know humans can only work well with a group of, of um, about 150 people. Have you heard of such a term? I, I have, yes. Um, I don't have any direct knowledge of um, that sort of uh, experimental basis for that. Um, again, humans are so highly variable. Um, you certainly can see um, groups larger than that that work really well uh, as groups, and you can certainly see groups much smaller than that that don't work. So, um, I'm, I, you know, I think one thing about humans is the plasticity, flexibility uh, in their patterns of social behavior and their social connections. And so, uh, it's not obvious to me that that's like a fixed, a fixed thing. And yeah, and and for B, is, is there such a number or? Is there a number where you know, colonies just stop working, or it's not as No, we've it's not, not really blood. seen that. No, in, in our experimental work, we work with very small colonies, and one would say, oh, well, maybe since they're much smaller, uh, we would do that for technical reasons to be able to work efficiently. Um, so, oh, well, maybe they're much smaller than uh, uh, a natural society, so maybe they don't work as well. But we do not see any, any drop-off uh, inefficiency on, on that end. So no, there's no, uh, no obvious uh, limits. People haven't pushed the limits uh, um, on something like that. You have a very, you, you, you mentioned that with your past student, you were able to genome uh, the sequence of these bees and then and that, that's how you guys were able to realize that their, their genome was different. Your part of a project is called the Earth Biogenome Project, which mm -hmm. the goal is to sequence the genome of all species in the, on Earth. Mm -hmm. How does the work look like once we have the genome of all the species on Earth? Mm -hmm. So um, the Earth Biogenome Project is, is a project for the infrastructure for biology for the 21st century. It's a, a repository, a highway system, um, the next Alexandria Library, whatever analogy you'd like to use, meaning that it holds it, it went, when the project will be finished, it will hold information that um, many different kinds of biologists, <coughs> excuse me, will be able to, to use. So the structure of the project is, it sounds very simple. Um, uh, specimen acquisition, we need to collect uh, representatives of all species and um, then sequence their genomes, um, then analyze their genomes and make that information available to the world, uh, publicly available. It, uh, it's, it's easy to say that. It's, it's each step that I've just described is, of course, incredibly complex. But in outlines, the outline of the project is, is very simple. And uh, um, if we, to the extent that we have that, and we already have many genomes, but nowhere near uh, um, all, we just have a tiny fraction, um, we, we can see the power of, of that knowledge and can be used. Because a genome, really, so I kind of like the library analogy, because a genome is really the ultimate book of life. And the reason why I say that is because you can read a genome as a history book. That is, you can learn about the past. You can read the genome as a parts list, that is, a present tense. Here's how you build an organism, um, plant, human microbe, whatever, and you could read the genome as a prophecy to predict um, traits and variation uh, between individuals and, and so forth. And so same book can be read as a history book, as a parts list, and as a prophecy. Um, so I could give you some examples if you'd like. Please. So um, uh, you probably uh, heard that the Nobel Prize in physiology and medicine was awarded to Svante Pabo for work on human origins. That work was based on some amazing breakthroughs that uh, Professor Pabo made together with colleagues to be able to read ancient DNA, to be able to collect DNA from fossils, from the floors of caves, and um, just some amazing technical virtuosity to be able to read DNA. Uh, we used to think that it just is degraded, there's no way, um, but uh, Svante Pabo was, one, uh, was the first to be able to pioneer these new methods and allowed us to peer into the past. So um, prior to this work in ancient DNA, 
it was thought that the Neanderthals, a hominid, similar, some similar traits to humans, Homo sapiens, that, that the Neanderthals were a kind of a mysterious group of human-like organisms that um, mysteriously disappeared. And uh, people didn't really know what happened to them. They saw them and the older human uh, evolution textbooks, uh, anthropology textbooks, would saw them as distinct from Homo sapiens. Well, uh, thanks to the work on Neanderthals, for which um, Dr. Pablo got the Nobel Prize, uh, we now know that there was contact with, uh, between Homo sapiens and the Neanderthals. There was breeding, so uh, genomes don't lie. You can, you can see that. So if you have the genomes of Neanderthals, genomes of Homo sapiens, you can use sophisticated computer programs to say, hey, there was some fooling around going on here between these, these two groups and giving us new appreciation for intermingling of populations. Um, we now know, and if you um, look at 23andMe, they sort of have a Neanderthal um, feature on the program. You can ask what percentage of a person's genome is inherited from the Neanderthals. Some, it's interesting from a, a curiosity point of view, but it's also interesting from a biomedical point of view because uh, to, back to your question about selective pressures and evolution, Neanderthals faced different evolutionary pressures, different environmental pressures. They evolved different ways of dealing with them, and some of those uh, make uh, present-day humans more susceptible to diseases or less susceptible to diseases. And so it, just a whole new window on um, human evolution by reading the genome as a as a history book. Reading the genome as a parts list, um, that's a little easier to just envision. Um, so um, we uh, are starting more and more to understand the functions of genes. We're still way off from knowing all of them. Probably we, uh, we probably only know the functions of about a quarter of the genes in the human genome, if you can believe that. So we have so much more to learn. The way we learn about it more and more is the comparative approach. So the more genomes we have, more species, more experiments can be done, the more we can learn um, about the function of genes. There are also new techniques in human biology, um, organoids, brain organoids, tissue organoids, to be able to, that you can manipulate genes and look at functions. So um, the more we know there, then we understand better the parts list of what's, what's here and how that differs from species to species and how that it gives rise to the differences that we see um, between individuals and between species. And then finally, as a prophecy. So it's possible to look at genomes, analyze genomes with sophisticated programs, and be able to start to see uh, differences that we can understand, say, between plant species. Some plants might have variants of genes that allow them to be more resilient in, in times of climate change. And so we can predict their response. Um, we can predict different health susceptibilities in humans um, for, uh, on the basis of some genes, just for some diseases, not very many yet, because we're still in such early days. But if you can read a genome sort of backwards, as it were, history, present day, and future, you can see how valuable they are. And if we had all the species on the planet and could do large-scale comparative analyses across these species, we would just have an amazing treasure trove of, of information to draw upon um, for inquiries in various areas, whether it's ecology, evolution, development, neuroscience, uh, endocrinology, medicine, um, you name it. Right. And the implications, as you mentioned, are limitless once we figure it out. And I think one of the things which I'm very concerned about is climate change and adaptation, mm -hmm. right? Because it's it's here and their community is already experiencing it in many ways across the world, right? And adaptation is something that cannot be um, what exponentiated as fast as climate change, right. right? So do you think we will be able to figure it out in time <laughs> to make a meaningful impact with the problems we're facing or what is your stance on it or what, what do you think about it? Yeah, I mean, we need to be doing 
way more than we're doing now to uh, to address climate change. There's no question about it. It's happening at at an alarming rate, and uh, there are excellent analyses that allow us to predict um, uh, the the timing and various scenarios. And we really need to be paying attention to that. And that's you know back to your question about cooperation across the world. Um, we really we really need that because uh, the changes certainly are happening at a rate that's faster, as you say, than what adaptation um, can can handle. Um, the uh, the way that um, the genome can be involved in predicting resilience is there can be variants of genes that already exist um, for particular plant species, let's say, or even other species that uh, endow individuals with more resilience. Um, and so it's those that uh, we're going to be counting on in, in a variety of species um, to, uh, to adapt. And it'll be uh, it's something that's, as you say, sort of a bit of a, of a race. And it's very, it's terrifying to think about it. Are you optimistic about it? Well, I, I'm generally speaking an optimist. And um, I think that, uh, that humans have consistently uh, been able to, um, to uh, develop solutions to major problems. Um, this one is uh, an existential problem, um, for sure. And um, you know, do we have the collective will to be able to, uh, to respond to this challenge in the way that it calls for is still an open question, but I'm hopeful, let's put it that way. So about 20 years ago or so, the human genome was sequenced. And everyone thought, you know, once we have that we will solve all diseases. We'll, we'll, we, would, like, we would cure cancer, for instance. And with your project, it's like once we have the, the genome of all the species, we will be able to do that. So two questions: like, how do you know you're right in that sense? Mm -hmm. And how? To, and you mentioned the comparative approach. Why do you think that's the right approach to make progress in the field? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, to your first question, the the important thing to realize is that. A genome is a sequence of DNA, and so and, and so sequencing the genome means you're reading the DNA, and then you use computer programs to tell you which parts code for genes, um, which then code for proteins, which parts are um, uh, related to the regulation of genes, and um, and then control which genes are turned on, where and when, how much, and so forth and then which parts of the genome we don't understand or may actually have no function at all, might be evolutionary relics. So that's what a genome is. And uh, DNA, as uh, the late biologist Edward Wilson said, DNA is the part of biology furthest away from the biological traits of interest, like behavior, like development, like crop yield, whatever species you're thinking about. There's so many levels of biology that exist between these two. Let's take my field, social behavior. You have DNA, and then you have RNA and protein, and that is all in a brain. So you have brain regions, you have circuits in the brain. Biology is a, is a science that has to do with levels, hierarchical levels of organization. And so having a sequence is just the beginning. You can't cure cancer with, a, with a, just a, a, a sequence of the human genome. It provides the basics for tools to be developed to be able to understand what happens when genes are turned on and turned off, which genes, which parts of the regulation of genes, <coughs> excuse me, are, are involved, and so on and so forth. So similarly, um, having the genome sequences of all the species on the planet will not lead to instant enlightenment. That's not the claim we are making. But um, again, it's, uh, I use the library analogy. You have to go to the library, you have to read it, you have to understand it, you have to draw upon knowledge from other sources to be able to get something from, um, from a book. And so for, it's that kind of uh, perspective. The, uh, the second question about the comparative approach is that um, evolution 
is a conservative force and um, what works well is conserved and so you find in many organisms and so you have an amplification of the signal when you use the, the comparative approach. So the yin and yang of biology um, has to do with similarities and differences. Biology is all about understanding commonalities among species, universals, if you will, and also differences. So it's not one or the other, it's both. It's the yin and yang of biology, similarities and differences. Genomes can allow you to explore both spaces um, broadly. So you can look for genes that are similar uh, across different species and if those genes are there and they're doing similar things in many different species, there is a really good chance that that's a very, very important thing that has to be present um, in, in organisms. Likewise, if you're looking at two different kinds of organisms, uh, you hone in on the differences and you say, oh, maybe that's what makes um, these, uh, whether it's species that are differences or even individuals um, different. So, um, the comparative approach gives you that ability to explore both similarities and differences, which are the really the heart, the root of biology. You give a presentation that, and you, you wrote this uh, Spanish proverb, which is something along the lines of the, the dilemma of, a, of two horns is the same bowl or, so, or something along those lines, mm -hmm. which is this idea that for some reason humans are not very good at at these nuanced topics, like for instance, in your research, you know, it's not nurture versus, versus nature, it's both, it's the same thing you were, you were saying about, like in, in, in many fields, like in physics, for instance, it's like quantum mechanics versus like general relativity, and like oh, there's always like this yes or no. Why do you think humans are always thinking yes or no, while we see in many experiments that it, it seems to be like in science, it's, Oftentimes, use both, or neither, or whatever. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. So the horns of a of the dilemma are on the same bull. Okay. Thank yep. you. And um, you know, it's 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 an interesting question. I can only speculate. I, I think um, we humans strive for certainty, um, for crisp thinking, for classifying, and for comparing and drawing conclusions. And so it's very uh, it's that's a very useful process to be able to to do that. At the same time, it's important to realize when that kind of approach is not what's needed for a problem at hand and, um, and then respond in a more nuanced way. So certainly nature nurture is, is that and it's really genomics that um, gave us those insights. Prior to genomics, the way we thought about nature and nurture was genes or the environment. Sounds like apples and oranges. Sounds like it's either biology um, or it's stuff from the outside. But one of the first major insights of genomics um, is that the environment affects the genome. So heredity affects the genome and the environment affects the genome. So we showed this with, with honeybees in one of the early experiments in the subfield of behavioral genomics. And so um, when you see that, um, then you have to develop a more nuanced perspective. And the nuanced perspective with respect to nature nurture is that um, there are hereditary effects on behavior and there are environmental effects on behavior and they both act via the genome. Hereditary effects are longer term from generation to generation and they affect uh, primarily the uh, sequence of DNA. So there can be mutations, changes in the DNA. Environmental effects uh, on the genome occur by influencing which genes are turned on and which genes are turned off. And so you have actions um, on both levels that explain um, how to look at nature and nurture um, in a more nuanced way. So you can't say, oh, it's either genes or the environment. It's genes acting over longer periods of time, longer time scales, or genes acting 
on shorter time scales. Yeah, I think yeah. of um, when you mention sequencing genes and like one day when we'll reach a stage where we have the repository of all these um, genomes, right? Mm -hmm. Have you considered like as someone who grows up, let's say in 10 years mm -hmm. and who gets interested in learning all of this, mm -hmm. it can be very overwhelming to just look at the expanse of knowledge that or the context that needs to be understood to, to even begin to understand all of these concepts and work in the field, right? Mm -hmm. Is there any way you can integrate like machine learning or something that can make such a broad topic into something much more digestible and and basically use it as a tool to use all of this information and like once you have all the sequences for the genomes and use it for the applications that we want to be used for? Yeah, we are really at a very exciting phase with respect to artificial intelligence, machine learning, and just really only scratching the surface of how it will serve humanity um, to be able to uh, assist in, in the ways that you're describing. I think, I think it will be entirely possible. At the same time, we have to be mindful um, and ensure that, uh, that the development of artificial intelligence uh, is broad and inclusive and um, does not exclude any groups uh, from participating in any ways uh, possible. But it has huge potential and it's gonna be very exciting. So already people are using artificial intelligence to um, annotate genomes, to predict what parts of the gene, of the genome uh, predict uh, genes and use that and automate the various processes that are going on. Those programs are only going to get better and better. So it's a very exciting um, time for, uh, for the use of artificial intelligence. Have you sequenced your own human genome? So I haven't done the full genome, but I have done 23andMe. Um, when I used to teach genes and behavior, I uh, did that, the 23andMe, which is a partial sequencing of the genome, kind of to show the class and to uh, point out what the, what the genome analysis predicted, traits, you know, my eye color, hair color, um, and so forth. So yeah, I, I, I certainly did. But I, I also remember, um, you know, right before I was about to hit the, press the button to, uh, to go ahead and approve it, I just, you know, stopped short for a second, like, well, it's going to be online, um, you know, is it, is it going to be private? And, and there are many, many issues associated with genomic security and privacy. Uh, we have stood up uh, one of the newer themes at the IGB. Themes are short for um, thematic research group, multidisciplinary thematic research group um, at the Carl R. Woese Institute for Genomic Biology, known as the IGB, as a theme devoted to genomic security and privacy. So it uh, uh, involves computer scientists, um, biologists, uh, uh, faculty from law, from political science, and, um, and uh, uh, anthropology, because it's really a multidisciplinary uh, problem of how do we ensure that uh, there is privacy and um, that genomes are used for the purposes that would, they were intended for. Um, and um, as you well know, um, with computer hacking um, and uh, genomes could be considered very attractive uh, targets for that. And so it's really important to ensure that uh, privacy and security of genomes uh, exist at a very high level to encourage people to have their genomes sequenced uh, because the more genomes that are sequenced, uh, human genomes that are sequenced, the more information can be drawn from them collectively um, to illuminate uh, diseases and, um, and uh, understanding the basis for traits, uh, a variety of traits, um, again, building on genomic information, not the genome doesn't read it out instantly, as I said before. You need to put it into context of, of other scientific inquiries. Did your name have a role to play in what you do today? <laughs> that you have to thank my mother for. <laughs> <laughs> What's the story behind your name? Like, why, why Gene? Robert's yeah, so I was named after uh, a relative, and uh, that person was named Genya, 
it was my father's sister, late sister, died, and um, and that name was uh, was given to me. And then who knew that <laughs> many years later we you'd be asking me this question about it? Yeah. So as I say, just uh, I thank my mother for it. When you were growing up, did you ever had a guess that you were may end up doing some sort of biology work, or you never expected that to happen? When I was a young child, I have to confess I was not thinking that I was on a track to be a scientist. Uh, when I was uh, um, 17 years old, I had an accidental exposure encounter with honeybees and got a chance to work with honeybees. And um, I fell in love with honeybees. And um, that, that really set the course for me. Prior to that, I hadn't thought really about science. So um, uh, Edward Wilson, a famous biologist, uh, uh, died recently, uh, wrote in his autobiography that there are two kinds of biologists. Uh, one kind fall in love with a question, and the other kind fall in love with uh, an organism. So those that fall in love with a question, then their job is to find the right organisms to address their questions. And many uh, scientists who thought they were going to be scientists when they were kids are interested in questions of, of various kinds. Um, and um, I was the second type, so I was not uh, thinking about biological questions, but fell in love with honeybees, and then the job is, uh, how do you figure out how to make a living with the, with the honeybees? So what, bi in other words, what biological questions, important questions, can be addressed um, with the species? And so I came in sort of that back-end way, if you will. Um, it's a minority group of scientists that come in that way, according to uh, E.O. Wilson and just my own personal experience, I think that's the case. Um, so I quickly settled on um, social behavior, social organization, um, division of labor, and questions of, uh, of that type um, to, uh, to, to guide my career. What has been the most fascinating learning experience for you in all these years of working with bees and everything? What do, what do you think has worked in terms of have you learned about them and have you thought about them? Ooh, that's a tough question. That's like asking you to, to say, which child do you love more, right? <laughs> so uh, we love all our discoveries. Um, they've all been great and they've all been, uh, been exhilarating when we have made them. I, I can focus on, on one set of um, studies that took us down the path of um, thinking about uh, nature nurture the way I described before and, um, and, and really connecting genomes and genomics to behavior. And um, so one case was um, there was a gene that had been studied in fruit flies called the foraging gene. And um, this gene in fruit flies uh, existed in, a, uh, in terms of DNA variation. So different flies had different DNA sequences of that gene, and the differences in DNA sequence were associated with differences in behavior. So this was a discovery made in the lab of Marla Sokolowski at the University of Toronto, and there were actually two distinct forms, sitters that were less active and rovers that were more active. So even before we sequenced the honeybee genome, I led the consortium that uh, sequenced the honeybee genome. Even before we did that, we thought that gene was interesting, but interesting from a, a perspective of, well, if there's DNA variation that gives rise to um, these differences in behavior that are more or less fixed, they're less active, these are more active, They've inherited that difference. We wondered whether you could transpose that into the honeybee uh, situation because um, bees that work in the hive are less active than bees that go out and fly. Flying is the most energetically uh, e extensive and expensive form of activity. So we wondered whether the same gene might be active on a shorter time scale rather than heritable differences might there be differences in the maturation process? So when a bee is young, working in the hive, 
less active. It looks more sort of like the sitter form in, in flies in terms of its activity, not its sequence, but its activity. And then when the bee gets older and becomes a forager, whether the gene is more similar in activity to the, uh, to the rover. And so we were asking for the first time, can you transpose long-term changes acting on the genome and short-term changes acting on the genome? So this was the work of uh, former graduate student Yehuda ben Shahar, who's now a full professor, Washington University in St. Louis. And it was a very creative uh, way of thinking about transposing these, these ideas and creating that connection between DNA and RNA. So we were thrilled when we saw that, yes, in fact, foragers do have rover-like activity of, uh, of this particular gene, and we could artificially induce that. We could treat young bees, make them become foragers by doing those manipulations, and um, gave us the first taste of that, suggesting, wow, yes, this is a real path to follow. Honeybees will be useful um, in this path. And then the second part to that was when we did start going into genomics, um, the very first experiment we did comparing nurses that work in the hive and foragers, comparing the activity of their genes uh, in the brain. And we found, this is the work of Charlie Whitfield, a former postdoc uh, in the lab, who was a professor here for a while also, that 40% um, of the genes, 40% of the genes show different levels of activity in a forager compared to a nurse bee which is huge. And then if we remove foragers and made some of them grow up, we could induce the same patterns as if they were foragers in the young bees. So great plasticity, environmental influences, that really led to um, my formulating a subfield that we call sociogenomics, which emphasizes the dynamic nature of the genome, the bi-directionality where you go from genes to behavior, but you also go from the environment to the genome, This, as we talked about uh, before. So those were really uh, very important uh, discoveries that were, that were made that really uh, led to this uh, new approach to understanding genes and behavior. You know, if you had to think of uh, at the limit, at, so at the limit of socio-genomics, uh, how would you, what would you, again, it's an speculation because you don't, you don't know, mm -hmm. but let's say you know everything about social genomics, you know everything about the field, how would you, like what would you do differently about helping find young people and people in general, their talent? You know, talent and, and you know, like, like society is like about like, you know, talents versus vocation, talents that you're naturally good at, vocation is what you get better at. So combine these two, those two things and if you have to imagine, mm -hmm. you know everything about social genomics, what would you create in society? You know, in schools is in a way the way to do that because you get to try different things and you get to see what you like in high school and before. Mm -hmm. Would you have uh, an educational system? Like what would you create mm -hmm. to help people find their true thing? Mm -hmm. Well, um, I think we always will have a healthy respect for the roles of the environment, familial influences, as well as inherited differences. And that's always going to be a highly complex and variable mix, mixture. So, you know, think about um, musical aptitude. So um, we, we look at, uh, at, at the ability, differential ability. Some people can carry a tune, some people can't carry a tune. Um, some people are good at playing musical instruments. Um, some people are, are not as good. Those that are good. So, you know, we, we, let's hone in on that. Um, what might be the roots of, of that? Well, there might be some inherited differences in um, certain kind of cognitive abilities that relate to musicality. And I'll just say we are at, totally at the beginnings of understanding that. But, um, you know, look at the environment as well. So how do you separate? So suppose you have uh, um, a young child that shows an interest or an early aptitude for music. That gets reinforced, um, positive reinforcement. Oh, that's great. Let's, let's give you lessons and, and um, 
and could you play for company when they come? And so all of those things, who knows how all of that is acting um, on the brain, on the expression of genes, on the development of the brain. And I think it's always going to be um, uh, are you familiar with the, the movie It's a Wonderful Life, how you can, you know, replay the tape and, and, and change one little thing and, and it could be an entirely different outcome. Mm. Um, it's always going to be that way. So um, we, will, we will learn more about environmental influences on, on gene activity and we will learn more about the functions of genes and the regulation of genes and hereditary influences, but it's always going to be, a, and it's a wonderful life, that if you just tweak something, it could send things on, a, on an entirely different direction um, for human behavior. And, uh, and I think we you know, need to understand that and, and learn more about the various components, but just accept that that is how it's going to be. So I, I don't think that we will get to a place where we will have a more deterministic um, uh, perspective. Uh, I think that will never be accurate. It'll make for great science fiction, like the movie Gattaca, but um, it's not really a, a realistic uh, aspiration, in my opinion. Yeah, that's interesting because I, I'm sure there are people who are, have these aptitudes for X, Y, and Z, but you just, you just never, you know, like you never, like they never found out that they had those those things. Yeah. So it's it's a it's an interesting question. Uh, yeah. To, to yeah, it is, and society is grappling with it. So, for example, there are now direct to consumer uh, tests. So there are certain genes, for example, that um, give rise to differences in muscle function. And there are um, those differences can be correlated loosely with different kinds of sports activity. So some kinds of uh, variants of muscle associated more with short, bursty activity of the muscles. Other variants can give rise to muscles that have more longer term strength, endurance kinds of things. And I'm sure you both realize different sports associated with bursty activity or, or more long term. And so um, some of these direct to consumer tests are, you know, sold to parents, hey, test your kids and see, um, you know, what's their direction so that you can, what's their aptitude, what's their difference so that you can direct them on a particular pathway. I do not endorse that at all. I think that we, there's no way we know anywhere near enough to, to come close to that uh, to that kind of approach. It's, it's, it's an oversimplification and uh, it could stifle some people in their, in their goals. Um, and so how we integrate that information in a way that still allows for, for choice um, is I think going to be a real challenge going forward. Because, you know, even though the test could say, you know, you should do, you should really do X. Again, it's a question, the question you've been thinking about for the last 20 years, which is about is nurture versus nature. Yeah. That no matter, okay, these texts would say X and sure, that may be true. But there's all like many other things that with the right environments, you could actually do be good at whatever. That's whatever right. Thing. Exactly. Exactly. That's right. That's right. So it's always going to be complicated. So more knowledge. Uh, of the genome and the functions of genes will always be helpful. We want that information, but we never want to turn it into a deterministic um, kind of uh, formula. Another speculation. Biology, it's, it's another thing that is very complicated, very complex, perhaps the most complex thing of all. Do you think we'll ever get to make more sense of biology or like, or get to the limit of making sense of, of that, or do you think that is the true limit of you know of humans that you will never be able to make sense of such complex mm -hmm. you know, systems? You know, I mean, the the history of of humanity is that we are a curious species, and we are always learning more about uh, ourselves and the world around us, and so I think we're always going to want to do that and be able to do that, and we develop new tools. Um, that allow us to see uh, biology and life and all aspects of, um, of existence on the planet at different scales. And that opens up new points, whether it's at macro scales, larger scales, or at micro and nano and sub-nano uh, levels. And so there's going to be mysteries revealed as we, as we do that. And then um, integration across those, those scales to... Uh, 
to achieve knowledge. So I, I think that's who we are as humans, and uh, we're going to keep doing it, and we're going to keep learning more and more and more, and peeling the onion and getting uh, getting layers, uh, layers, and that's that is what we do. And it's exciting. It's you know such a privilege to be a scientist, um, to live in a society that um, that encourages such activity, that supports such activity, to be at a university um, such as this, where you know we have amazing students who want to come and learn and and um, and uh, participate in in discovery, and who want to take that knowledge and apply it uh, to make the world a better place, to improve the world. It's um, th those are you know. The, among the highest forms of, uh, of activity that we can imagine. And on this note, what advice would you give a highly motivated student or uh, like a high school student or a college student who's listening to, or watching to this right now? Um, I think w one thing is see if you can find your passion. So are there areas, are there activities, are there kinds of questions, um, kinds of activities that uh, that really grab you, and um, you know they're not going to always fall in your lap like happened to me. I consider myself incredibly fortunate. I did not get up in the morning and and say today's going to be the day that I find what I want to want to do for the rest of my life. It was just you know much more uh, accidental uh, than that. Um, so I think uh, what one needs to do is put oneself into situations, uh, explore. Um, learn about different things, uh, you know, get beyond your comfort zone, take courses outside your areas, spend, you know, have time think, to think um, and to experience and to, um, to do those kinds of things that put you in a situation where you can develop broader, broader perspectives. So I think that's, you know, that's very important. And, um, you know, I, I worry that, uh, that you know, our, our youth today feel I have to figure out what I want to do right away. There's a lot of pressure, um, and um, that's fair. I mean, there is, uh, but at the same time, trying to expand your horizons as much as you can, um, I think, is also very important. And like seeking opportunities, and just I think that the, the most the hardest step is to take that first step, yeah. which is to to acknowledge the fact that it's okay to not know what you want to do, but you you are also comfortable exploring and trying out new things. That's right. That's right. For sure. And perhaps at one point you'll be lucky enough that something will happen, like it happened to you and you'll find that, that, that thing. So if, if that event didn't happen, like what do you think you'd be, you would be doing? I don't really know. I hadn't gotten that far yet. Uh, uh, <laughs> I did not have any strong, strong leanings at that point. But you were 17, so you were probably thinking about college. Or... Yeah, I was thinking of college, and I, I probably would have started in uh, liberal arts and sciences um, and, and just explored. Yeah. We have a, a section at the end that we call the overrated or underrated. Uh -huh. So we give you a statement, and just, it's fun. So And you say underrated or overrated. Okay. So the first one is that there's been an exponential decrease of the price of sequencing uh, genomes. Overrated or underrated? Underrated. Do you, could you give a, a description of why you think that is? Like, how, like, how does the work look like at when human genomes just cost $1 or $5? Yeah, I, I say underrated because the, uh, we are just beginning to understand the impact of the rapidly declining and rapidly, rapidly declining prices in genome sequencing and all the doors that it can open up. I. Um, sometimes uh, give a lecture on consumer genomics. Um, and it's based on that exact starting point. And the idea is that uh, consumer genomics allows us to look at the parallels between the digital revolution, which has been going on now for the last five, six decades, and the genomics revolution, which is much younger, about two decades, as you said. and. Um, the parallels are really um, very uh, amazing because uh, what has fueled the digital revolution is the rapidly declining costs in computing, Moore's law. You, uh, as engineers, you certain, certainly know that. And the idea then is that as computing has gotten cheaper and cheaper, 
creative people have discovered new ways of using computing. So who knew 30 years ago that we need computers in our refrigerators? You know, who knew 40 years ago that a, in order for a car to function, it needs to have so many computers uh, in it? And yet that's the world we live in now because computing has gotten cheap enough to be a commodity. And so smart people, creative people can see its use in all different areas, including consumer products. Likewise, genomics is just getting started in there. And so we have direct to consumer medicine and genealogy and a variety of different kinds of products. Um, and we're only at the beginning there. So I think uh, that's why I see it's underrated. You did an experiment once where you gave cocaine to bees and you realize they dance, uh, they move faster and they dance faster. Using cocaine to do research, uh, mm -hmm. underrated or overrated? Mm -hmm. Weird question. Under, underrated, yeah. Well, if it's used properly, it can be a very potent tool. Yeah, so in our case, um, that research uh, had, had uh, a very specific purpose, which is to explore the reward system in the context of social organization and social behavior. So we started this conversation talking about incentives. And the reason why su there is such a thing as an incentive is because their brains have reward processing. So something can be feel good. And so the reward system is talk about conserved. We see that in, in the brains of all organisms that have been studied. Um, so food lights up the reward system. So um, that's, that's one element of that. So reward systems evolved in brains to help guide and shape behavior. Reward systems are also very flexible and can be coupled with a variety of external stimuli. And just think about it with food. You know, if you're, if you're hardwired, so only one kind of food is going to um, feel good when you eat it. Well, um, there's a role for that. Those are called specialists. There are species that are specialists, but um, that's going to be a narrow approach. Uh, many animals, are much more flexible with respect to food. So they might sample some food. And, oh, that's pretty good. Well, I'm going to eat more of it. How do they, what's pretty good? Well, that's affecting a brain region and, and, that's, and that's working that way. So we get that for food. Um, we had the idea a number of years ago that social behavior might also feel good. Cooperating might also feel good. And just take the intuition. When you look at child rearing, um, that's a big part of child rearing is to um, imbue children with the idea that when you do something for someone else, you should feel good. So you give them brownie points, you reward them, you, you compliment them. That's affecting the brain. So you um, make it more likely that a child's going to do that again. Um, so that's, that's affecting the reward system. So we um, wondered whether that approach in thinking about the evolution of social behavior could apply to the honeybee. So we looked at the dance language and um, the dance language is the honeybee's symbolic uh, communication system. Because um, if you compare an insect that has a uh, more of a solitary lifestyle, it doesn't live in a large group, doesn't live in a society, doesn't coordinate its activities, with others, um, when such an individual finds good food, it eats more, it eats that food. When a honeybee finds good food, she doesn't eat more. She collects more of it and brings it home and she dances more. So there's a me to we switch there from selfish behavior to cooperative, altruistic behavior. We knew uh, from studies of fruit flies that eating behavior was regulated by a particular neurochemical. And um, we tested that neurochemical to see if it made bees dance more. And the same neurochemical that makes flies eat more makes honeybees 
dance more. So we wanted to interpret that in the context of reward. So we stepped back and said, well, what's one of the most potent chemicals out there that affects the reward system? And sadly, and I emphasize that word, sadly, the answer is cocaine. So what is addiction? Addiction is the hijacking of the reward system so that you want more, you want more, you want more. And um, the reward system is highly flexible in what it's coupled to. And that's great to allow plasticity. You can learn new things. And if it feels good, that helps you form the right uh, uh, opinions and pathways uh, associated with that. It can also be bad. So someone can be can become addicted to music, you know, so that's great. So they become hardcore musician, they practice all the time, and as long as they take care of everything else, you know, that's okay. If you're addicted to a drug uh, of abuse, um, that's not okay. So cocaine is that. And so we thought, well, in order to help understand whether we can interpret our findings that this neurochemical, same neurochemical that makes flies eat more, makes honeybees dance more, in order to interpret that in the context of social reward, we picked cocaine and asked whether it makes bees dance more. And since it's chemically related to the chemical that we were studying, it had a built-in connection there. And so um, it was a way to push the, the analysis forward and, um, and explore that social reward concept. And so that's why we did it. That was quite a fascinating explanation. And, uh, and even thinking about addiction in, in that way as the hijacking of the reward system, mm -hmm. it's, such an, it's just such an interesting way to look at it because in, in a way there are many addictions in today's society. Mm -hmm. So in, in, like in your perspective, like what do you see are the modern day addictions? Perhaps that we don't realize yet, but in the future we'll, we'll look back and yeah, that was a thing that hijacked the reward system of humans? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, um, like anything, it's, it's a word that, that evokes a certain set of meanings. Mm -hmm. um, and then you need to unpack that and, um, and then decide what you're exactly talking about. So, um, and I'm not an expert on drugs of abuse, but um, the general idea is if you're talking about an addiction, um, that is detrimental to your well-being. So your family life is affected, your personal life is affected, you take more risks um, than, um, than is reasonable, you know, then you say, hey, I got a problem, you know, there's an addiction there. And so like a lot of people say, I'm addicted to my phone or my kid's addicted to, you know, to their, to their cell phone, to video games. So you need to look at that carefully. Are they um, ignoring everything else, are they ignoring family, are they letting things go, um, uh, at, you know, to, to the detriment of their, of their well-being, or are they just doing that, you know, what seems like a whole lot. And it's, and it's a scale, it's a relative scale. Um, you know, something to one person might seem excessive and to someone else might not seem excessive. So I think it's really hard to say. You know, that said, certainly people are worried about video game addiction, right? That's a thing. People are worried about that. And, um, and people are worried about, of course, drugs of abuse. And, uh, and, and, and we think about um, the use of, of computers and, and cell phones and, and parents are worried about that with respect to their, to their kids. How that's gonna shake out, you know, I think is, uh, is maybe too early to tell. Uh, but it's, those, are, those are the kinds of things that we are on the lookout for. The next one, um, the genomic sequence of services like 23andMe, underrated or overrated? Ooh, that's a tough one. Um, can I give two answers? Well, sure. So overrated because the amount of information that we have so far about human genomes mm. and what they predict um, because of course 23andMe at its root is prediction, right? Oh, you have this sequence, then we predict you have brown hair. They're not looking at you, they right. don't know, um, and so forth. 
So it's overrated in the amount of information that we currently have. It's underrated because as we get more information, you know, having that connection to your own biology, um, at least from an optimistic perspective, could be very empowering. Mm. It could help you make right lifestyle choices if you are susceptible to certain diseases. Um, and so you can take steps to, uh, to uh, stay on the right side of that. Of that. So really, uh, you know, uh, the, more, the more information we have, the better um, such services will, will be. Yeah, yeah. An example of uh, something that's way overrated right now in that direction, um, but only for the same reason, is there are direct-to-consumer um, products that uh, will predict what kind of wine you like um, based on your genome sequence. There is no evidence for that at all. And so uh, I, it would be hard pressed to predict what kind of evidence it would take to make that, uh, to make that realistic. Maybe there will be, but um, that one's overrated right now. Last one. Um, I don't know if you've seen it, but the animated B movie, underrated or overrated? Underrated. So are you talking about uh, um, the Jerry Seinfeld B movie? That one? The B movie. I th is it the I same one? I yeah. think it's, yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Underrated. Um, <laughs> uh, so I'll tell you a funny story. Uh, I was called for, uh, for an interview about that movie from, uh, by a journalist in the New York Times. And the particular question was, um, does it bother you that the star of the movie, uh, the B movie, is a male, Jerry Seinfeld, Right. Um, when everyone knows that in the B society, it's the females that run mm -hmm. the show. The males are very peripheral in the Honey Bee Society. Does that bother you? And I said, I am not going to give, um, so first I acknowledged, yep, yeah, that's not accurate, that's true. I said, but I am not going to give a negative quote about the B movie because hundreds of millions of people learned about pollination mm -hmm. um, because of that movie. It was a very accurate depiction of the role, the vital role that honeybees play in um, safeguarding our nation's food supply. Fifteen billion dollars a year of food is uh, produced uh, because of honeybees' uh, pollination activities. And, um, you know, our Who's going to um, affect more people and teach more people about pollination? A nerd like me or Jerry Seinfeld? Mm. And so it's no contest. And so um, that movie was extremely valuable um, in getting the word out about um, pollination. And, you know, if you looked at the bees in the movie, they had sneakers on. So, <laughs> you know, I mean, give me a break. Uh, they took some creative license there. And uh, yeah, it would have been nicer if that was a female protagonist, no question about it. But I think the value of that movie was far, um, far outweighed those uh, inaccuracies. And we'll see in, in many years, many researchers that will be doing the type of works that, that, you're, that, that you're doing that were inspired because of that movie. That's right, so exactly. That will be like their thing, exactly. their, their accidental thing. That's right, that's right, so. good point, good point, yep. And yeah, with that, I think that would be a great place to, to end our conversation, and, and really thank you so much for, for coming. Great, well, I really enjoyed this. Um, you guys are very uh, asked very interesting questions, thoughtful questions, and uh, this was a lot of fun. So thank you very much for having me, it was my honor. Thank you. Great. And thank you for watching. I hope you enjoy learning about sequencing genomes, consciousness, evolution, and all these deep questions that you wouldn't normally think. But once you sit down and start thinking about them, you, you realize how important those questions are. And the people that are currently working in all these fields to get to the bottom of all these questions. Um, we talked about how the society would look like once we have the repository of all the, the gene, se genome sequenced and the, the limitless implications it would have on the society that we live in currently. I think it's a very exciting future to look forward to and these are the kind of topics that you wouldn't normally come across but would only learn when you try to seek for it and 
talk to experts like Dr. Robinson. So I would like to thank you once again for coming and sharing all these great ideas and leaving us with that great advice of how you should always keep exploring. Um, you'll never know when you'll find your next big inspiration and just being a little more curious. So thank you once again for coming. Um, thank you for watching. This is the UIC Talk Show, and we'll see you next time. Yeah, thanks again for having me. It was a pleasure. Awesome. All right.